Good morning. Welcome to another Sunday Science Q&A. And uh, this one at the last minute has changed somewhat. Uh, Helen Chersky has uh, suddenly been called away by Fully Charged, uh, which is the podcast that she works on, which many of you will probably know. And uh, so I was just going to quickly mention, uh, to use this as a plug, that also if you go to our Cosmic Shambles YouTube, uh, you will find Helen talking about electric motorcycles, which very much kind of fits in with the whole Fully Charged world. And also we've just done a whole thing. Well, Go on to Cosmic Shambles, and if you like motorbikes, there's more stuff than there used to be, and there's more stuff coming up as well. I don't really deal with the motorbikes generally, though I have done a little bit. I wasn't allowed to have a motorbike when I was a child because my granddad lost an eye. There we go. That in, in a motorbike, not in a gambling incident involving motorbikes, just so you know. Um, so welcome to the Sunday Science Q&A, the slightly different version. In a moment, you're going to meet John Joe McFadden, uh, who you might know as a molecular geneticist, uh, also as uh, an author. Uh, I think the last time that uh, I spoke about one of his books was probably talking with uh, Jim Al Clearly talking about Life on the Edge, which was a book that they wrote together. Um, and uh, we're going to take, <coughs> excuse me, questions as well uh, about molecular genetics and also about Occam's razor. But you will find out more uh, in a moment about why we're going to talk about Occam's razor. A uh, few extra things. Also, if you can support us via Patreon, uh, <laughs> go to cosmicshambles.com uh, uh, and you will find out all those details or you can just go straight to Patreon. 
patreon.com slash cosmic shambles and you'll find out how to support us we've got loads of new things coming up uh a new series which has just started called a book you might not have read uh, in fact the first one that we talked about uh was uh, with tom shakespeare the journal of a disappointed man which is a fantastic uh and very very beautiful book there's a uh, a wonderful old slightly pre-pelican uh edition though at one point it will have been a pelican and uh, the next book we're talking about is a book called The Punk, the first novel uh, about, well, it's, it's barely a novel, actually. Basically, it was a short story that was written by a young man called Gideon Sams who threw it in the bin. And uh, then his mum took it out of the bin, eventually got it published. And uh, Pete Townsend, rather uncharitably, said it should have been kept in a bin. But I think it's a rather uh, wonderful piece of work. That's the next thing that we're talking about on that. Uh, and I'm talking about that with John Robb. Uh, the latest book shambles is Anil Seth, who is uh, a brilliant neuroscientist. If you You've seen his TED talk about being under general anaesthetic and the nature of of where is uh, our consciousness. His book is exploring uh, in a very rigorous manner uh, our understanding of our brains and how they create the mind uh, that can appear to be us uh, or is us, depending on the way you view those things. And also we've taken uh, Eddie Glaude Jr., who we had a book shambles with the other day. Uh, we've now turned that into a tips for existence because there were so many other bits that we couldn't put in uh, because of just of the length of the interview as well as lots of uh, interesting bits uh, about clips of James Baldwin and clips of Eddie Glaude as well on various American news uh, channels talking. There was loads of stuff there. So that's going out to Tips for Existence. And the next Tips for Existence after that will be Carolyn Porco, who uh, was once described by a photographer friend of mine as the greatest photographer in the world. She's certainly one of the greatest photographers of the world as well. Uh, and uh, she talks about her work with NASA and also many different discussions uh, about extraterrestrial possibilities so there we go that's the basic getting you up to date business done uh now let's meet john joe mcfadden hello hello john joe good morning good morning robin now i'm gonna before we talk about your new book life is simple uh i suppose for some people we have more and more terminology that sometimes we get scared to actually ask what people do because we think well we look like an idiot but i don't mind looking like an idiot it's one of the jobs that i do so can you tell those who are watching exactly what is the world of, of molecular genetics and when did it become part of science? Um, it came become part of science about, um, I guess, 50 years ago in the 1970s when um, scientists discovered not only what uh, uh, genes were made of, but how to manipulate them. So molecular genetics is really manipulating genes. It's the kind of thing that people can do to make the kind of vaccines that we're protecting ourselves from COVID and also to um, uh, discover the uh, causes of genetic diseases and to um, the kind of things that we're trying to do uh, in my work is find out ways of killing the TB bacillus more effectively, basically by manipulating the genes to find out its vulnerabilities. So that's the kind of work that I do with molecular, molecular genetics. But I'm also, oh, um, I also do, um, I'm also director of the Quantum Biology Doctoral Training Center at the University of Surrey. So I have another interest reflected in the book that you mentioned with uh, uh, Jim Al-Khalili about quantum biology. So that's another of my um, interests at the University of Surrey. We see quantum biology, very important thing in terms of uh, Brian Cox, who uh, anyone who regularly listens to Monkey Cage will know that he often dismisses all the other sciences apart from physics uh, in a jovial way, by the way. It's not it's not uh, meant to sometimes people consider that there's real intention. Behind it. But one of the things was that his fascination with biology began when he realized there was quantum behavior in photosynthesis. Mm. And that's something that I find particularly fascinating, which is as science becomes in one way more specialized, each discipline becomes more and more, you know, the focus on it. But at the same time, also, you then get this line through it where you see a union of so many what had previously been seen as separate disciplines, certainly, I would say, in the public mind. Yeah. And that um, brings me neatly through to the theme of uh, life is simple, because uh, the progress of science can really be seen as a kind of progressive simplification where, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the medieval world, the stars, suns and planets were pushed around or thought to be pushed around by angels or gods and, um, and different rules applied on earth as those in the heavens and winds were pushed by spirits and people got sick because of, of uh, lots of uh, um, metaphysical entities that were thought to exist. And now we've kind of just got rid of all of those and distilled things down to the smallest number of 
um, causes, if you like. And that really was brought about by fusion of lots of different areas, like Newton fused the um, physics of the heavens with the physics on Earth. And um, uh, people like um, uh, uh, the, the science of thermodynamics fused the molecular world with um, the uh, physics of Newton. So it's uh, all been a, a progression of unifications which have led, conversely, to a simpler world. We need fewer rules to understand. This goes back to Brian Cox's, that we know that the table I'm looking at over here is uh, uh, subject to quantum laws. So no, it comes as no surprise that life is also subject to quantum laws. But what occurred to me many years ago was that that was fundamental and that life is really about the manipulation of protons, electrons, etc. And if you ask a physicist what law governs the motion of protons, electrons, etc., they'd say it's quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is inevitable in life. See, that's, that reminds me of this, uh, uh, Niels Bohr, who said many obviously wonderful uh, aphoristic quotes uh, about uh, quantum physics, quantum mechanics. But one of them was that thing where he said, everything that we see that is definitely real is made of things which, when we get down to a certain level, are no longer real. And that's one of the bits where uh, even if science has become simplified, it nevertheless becomes extremely disturbing when people first hear some of these ideas. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think. Uh, Einstein said something similar about a photon, that uh, every Tom, Dick and Harry thinks they know what a photon is, but they don't. I mean, even a photon, what is it? Nobody really knows. But we can use the equations to predict where it goes. So, uh, but what things are is still the kind of metaphysical problem that uh, um, in the medieval world, people like William of Ockham wrestled, wrestled with. And um, and those problems still remain. You know, what's at the ultimate reality? Um, what's an electron, a proton? Um, we we put them, um, uh, we describe them in various ways and predict their behavior, but what they actually are is still somewhat mysterious, I think. Now, why did you, th this book covers a lot of time. You, 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 we cover Plato and the idea of forms. Uh, you then, you know, build towards William of Ockham. We go through the Dark Ages, obviously, before that. You then uh, continue and, and we look at Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler. And I just wondered, what was it that inspired you to decide that now you wanted to understand how our methods of thinking have changed and by changing those methods and i suppose in some ways increasing the language because that 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 old wittgenstein quote you know the limit of, of my language is the limit of my world and you'd see that reading your book that there's a point where if we don't yet have the words for certain ideas those ideas almost can't come to life and they almost can't be investigated yeah yeah well actually what provoked me um, was a very uh, mundane event i was um, attending a conference held at the university of surrey where i work and uh, this is in the area of systems biology, which is another area that I, I also work in, which is using mathematical models to predict how biological systems behave. And um, the problem then, as in all modeling problems, is how complicated you need to have the models in order to, um, in order to make useful predictions. And we have, we use models, for example, to model the weather, to model the climate, um, but we also use them to model uh, living organisms. A colleague of mine from um, University of Manchester and also Amsterdam, uh, Hans Westerhoff, gave a talk saying Occam's razor is not uh, appropriate in biology. Biology has no Occam's razor. So, and making the claim that this principle that you should take the simplest solution doesn't apply in biology. Um, now, Occam's razor is probably more familiar to physicists. It's the principle that you should take the simplest solution. So, for example, in modeling, use the simplest model that fits the data. Hans was saying that you can't do that in biology because biology is irreducibly complex, as he called it. And um, I felt that um, I didn't really know much about Occam's razor at the time. But uh, on my drive into work, I passed the village of Occam. And I thought, OK, I'll find out a little bit more about William of Ockham and his razor. So I did that evening and I researched into this guy. And the more I researched into him, the more fascinated I became. He has a really interesting history. He was a Franciscan friar um, in the 13th, 14th century, went to Oxford to study theology, which was at the time called the Queen of Sciences. And... Um, and then um, became famous for his use of the razor looking for simple solutions. And basically his solutions to 
theology being the queen of sciences, was that theology wasn't a science, and theology and science were two separate, disparate disciplines. One was based on faith, theology obviously, and the other on reason. As far as I know, and I still have, I would want someone to correct me on this, no one in the history of the world before William of Ockham so clearly made a distinction between science and religion or theology, such that um, 50 years later, Florentine musicians were singing songs about it and uh, singing songs about how, um, how science and religion should not be mixed. So it was extraordinarily influential. But he used his razor to do this, this principle that um, um, science should be based on the simplest solution, which he didn't apply to theology, of course, because it's full of angels and gods and all this, um, all these kind of entities. But he said that science should be based on the simplest solution. Well, he was accused of heresy for this, so he had to go to uh, travel to Avignon to face charges before the uh, Pope. Uh, but ended up accusing the Pope of being a heretic, so having to flee Avignon, chased by a posse of pap papal soldiers, and um, and sought refuge with the Holy Roman Emperor, who was crowning his own Pope in Rome at the time. So he already has a fascinating story, but it got me thinking about what he was saying. And basically he was saying that whenever we make an argument, whenever we reason, we have to choose the simplest solution. So I gave a talk the next day at this conference saying that, OK, life can be as complex as we know it is. But when you analyze a set of data and you're trying to pin it to a model with, say, a certain number of genes, then you have to choose the simplest model that will fit your data. Otherwise, you're overfitting. Otherwise, you're kind of putting data into noise, experimental noise as well. Basically, what uh, additional parameters allow you to do is tweak any model so it'll fit any set of data. And really, all of science is about removing those tweaks. And as we were talking about before, as science became simpler, it removed things like different rules in the heavens compared to the Earth. Suddenly that was removed. So now the heavens and the Earth have to obey the same rules. And that's a huge simplification. When in chemistry, uh, caloric was replaced with essentially Newtonian mechanics at a molecular level, the science of thermodynamics, that got rid of another entity. Uh, when Darwin uh, and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace discovered the theory of natural selection, you didn't need a creator to make all of species. So science really is a way of getting rid of entities that you don't require and finding the simplest solution. And, and I've become more and more convinced that that is the central core of science. It's what distinguishes science from everything else we do. As a, as a scientist, would you ever accept a complex solution when a simpler one fits? I don't think any scientist would. Now, it interests me when you talk about him actually dividing up theology and, and then natural philosophy sciences. The, uh, um, has that made you think at all about those different ideas of what that division is? Obviously, Stephen Jay Gould talked about non-overlapping magisteria, and there's been much debate about that. And there's some scientists I know who are both uh, uh, brilliant uh, in terms of their scientific field and also find a place where they place some form of God as well. Has has that given you some sense of, of, of how people are able to place what can sometimes see as, as you know, a tremendous clash of ideas inside one mind? Yeah. Well, uh, William Wacom um, himself, he was a Franciscan friar, as far as we know, he remained devout throughout his life. But he separated science from his religion, and uh, as I put it in, in uh, the book Life is Simple, he essentially provided a third way for people who are devout to keep their science away from their religion and theology. And all the subsequent scientists of the age of reason use that third way. They, Newton was very devout, but he kept his devotion out of his science. Similarly, Copernicus, similarly, Galileo, similarly, all of the great scientists uh, adopted this third way that William of Ockham proposed, in which you have a belief in metaphysical entities such as gods and angels, but that doesn't interfere with how you reason about the world and that you use Occam's razor when you reason about the world um, for science, but you can still believe in angels if you wish to 
but keep them out of your science. And that goes down to, as far as I can see, William of Ockham. So I think it is a, a, how most people, most scientists I know who are devout, they don't bring their devotion into their science. And that's and that's really how it works. And that's how it, how it worked in the West, where it didn't work in other societies. And we know in, in even in... Um, even in uh, Christian uh, societies, people still try to weld them together. We know of creationists who still want to weld the science of uh, of biology to the creation myth. And this also happens in the Islamic world and many other cultures. But in the West, we broke that link. And William of Ockham was a man who did, who said, no, keep the science and the religion and theology separate. And um, that third way has think, dominated science ever since. Did that worry you at all when Hans Westerhoff talked about the idea of irreducible complexity? Because, of course, that is something that's come up a lot uh, within arguments for creationism stroke intelligent design. Uh, and, and would it worry you if biology did, if, if it was? But oh, actually, there is a point where it becomes irreducible uh, complexity that you think, well, hang on a minute. That is that's a dangerous way to go. Well, it isn't really, because the uh, Occam's razor is often formulated in the uh, simple uh, form that entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. Now, everyone, when they criticise Occam's razor, they forget about the second clause, which is extremely important, beyond necessity. So it says you can have as many parameters as you need in a model in order to account for the data, but don't add any more. So there are eight or nine planets in the solar system, not one, because we can see data out there which disproves any simpler theory. Theory And similarly, when you address a, um, a biological problem like we were trying to do, looking at metabolism in, in living cells, you can have a model with 10, 50 or 3000 parameters. Now, obviously, a model with 3000 parameters, you can fit to any data set you like. Um, and, um, uh, and that's what happens if you use models that are too uh, complex. And the problem with them is that then the probability that the model is correct, even though it fits the data, becomes a very small. Simple models, in contrast, make very sharp predictions. So if they fit the data, then the probability that they are right is relatively high. And this comes out of Bayesian reasoning, the likelihood functioning of Bayesian, function of Bayesian reasoning. So if you have two models, one complex and one uh, simple, that both fit the data, Bayesian reason tells you, choose the simplest. So Bayesian reasoning automatically incorporates Occam's razor in this principle of uh, the likelihood of the data given your model. S uh, simple models have a high probability of generating that data because they can't generate much data that's very different because they've got very few parameters to, to uh, uh, tweak. So if they fit the data, then the probability of that data is high. Complex models could fit any data. So although they will fit a particular data set, they could fit a billion other data sets. So the probability of a single data set that you see is low. And that's how uh, Bayesian reason really interprets Occam's razor. Um, it's, uh, it can be interpreted as entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity, i.e. Occam's razor, but it's there in Bayesian reasoning, which is increasingly fundamental to a lot of science today. Now, you start the book talking about uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation. And uh, yeah, there's a great quote from Neil Turek, a uh, theoretical physicist. Uh, he says, the universe turns out to be stunningly simple, so much so that we don't know how nature got away with it. Now, I love that that idea. So can you talk a little bit about, first of all, that discovery of, 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 of the CMB and why Occam's razor, why parsimony was so important to that? Well, um, the uh, discovery was first um, through a um, pair of scientists who, uh, in the US who were looking at the cosmic, uh, looking at microwave radiation as a way of mapping the sky. And when they, um, Penzias and Wilson are uh, their names, and when they were lo looking at, they were using a great big thing called the Horn Telescope um, in, um, um, uh, in, uh, in the US. And it map the sky in microwaves but when they tried to um to uh find a quiet region of the sky in order to zero their equipment to zero microwave radiation they could never do it 
they always detected microwave radiation out there and they were puzzled by this and they tried very hard to get rid of this microwave radiation but it was always there and they couldn't understand it independently the big bang had been discovered and scientists were looking at ways of proving the big bang and one of them was that um that microwave radiation would be left as a kind of smoking gun of the Big Bang. And then this news came to uh, Penzias and Wilson, and they recognised that what they were looking at um, may well be the Big Bang, and that they were detecting the um, smoking gun of the Big Bang, the remnant of radiation left by the Big Bang. And then when um, uh, satellites went out to do more delicate and sensitive measurements of the cosmic microwave background, they discovered that it was extraordinarily smooth. There's hardly any variation. It's completely smooth everywhere you look, suggesting that the early universe was extremely simple, which is what provoked Neil Turok's statement that the universe is, is uh, uh, so stunningly simple that we don't really know how it got away with it. So it seems that the universe started off in a very, very simple state. And the kind of theme of my book is that it kind of the universe still remembers that simplicity, although it's become vastly more complex with stars and planets and suns and people like us talking about it. Um, but at its core, it still retains that simplicity of its origin. And this is why Occam's razor proves to be so useful in science, because it digs down to the simplest solutions and finds those things like gravity that can account for both the um, motion of the planets around the sun and the motion of an apple falling from a tree. It finds those features of the universe that simplify things and digs down to the simple bones of our universe. And that I think is, I think, one of the reasons why Alchemist Razor is so useful, because the universe at its core is simple. Now, it's interesting. You, you, you write about Tycho Brahe and, and Johannes Kepler, and of course, Johannes Kepler, incredibly important work in, in, in astronomy. But also, he, you know, Kepler got hung up on an idea which was ultimately overly complex, but he was determined. It's, it's an interesting thing because we can talk about it, but that idea that the positioning of the planet was also in a line, I hope I'm saying this in the right way, it, it uh, uh, matched also the nature of perfect solids. Is that yeah. important? And, uh, and I, I find that very very interesting because there are some people now who are writing books saying they worry about the fact that very often the beauty of science is underlined and that if we're always searching for beauty sometimes we might become overly complex because ah now we found the pattern that makes it beautiful and it feels that what kepler was trying to do and again if you could if you could explain to people a little bit about what what kepler originally was trying to do that was caught up in trying to place a philosophy of beauty uh, into the astronomy yeah, yeah, it is. It is uh, interesting and it is something that we kind of recognise in many, uh, both inside and outside of science, simplicity has a certain beauty associated with it. and We admire things that are beautiful and simple. So, um, and philosophers have long admired simplicity. Plato and Ast Aristotle both admired simplicity, but were always prepared to throw additional stuff into the mix if they needed to, uh, if they felt they needed to. Um, but yeah, uh, Kepler, so Kepler was a fan of the heliocentric system um, described by Copernicus. But at the time, there wasn't a lot of support for the heliocentric system. And basically, it was because it didn't actually make any better predictions than the earlier, much more complex Ptolemaic system. And um, uh, Kepler um, thought he, he got the solution by um, because he was a mystic. And not rather like Copernicus, he was also rather mystical, uh, mystically inclined. And Newton was as well, of course, interested in alchemy. Um, but uh, Kepler was in, inspired by this idea that somehow the distance of the planets from the sun were could be described by the platonic solids, which are the solids which have identical faces, um, the sphere, the square, the tetrahedron, etc., and if you fit one inside of the other, then you can only form a number of different nested shapes. And he did this with the nested shapes and found that the distance between the orbits, when he did this with the nested shapes, the distance between the circumference of each of the shapes was around about the distance between the planets from the sun. So he came, 
it was a jaw-dropping moment. Wow, I've discovered the secret to the universe. And it's this mystical Pythagorean, comes back to, goes back to Pythagoras, this mystical Pythagorean idea about the music for the heavens and that they're celestial orbs because they believe that the planets were um, were um, uh, rotated on crystal orbs, um, that these crystal orbs made a kind of music. And the beauty of this music was provided by the fact it was made by these platonic solids. So he set to work on this and um, he, he had some initial success, published a book making this claim. He got a job then with Taika Brahe and, um, and Taika Brahe, the uh, greatest observational astronomer that, astronomer that had ever lived, was generating extremely accurate astronomical data and Kepler got to work on this data and tried to try to prove his model that the Pythagorean solids were the fundamental to the cosmos and he failed. And um, and that was and it was interesting because the, uh, the, the way that it led him to the truth to the um, model that did succeed. And that was because the Pythagorean model had as its uh, had a huge advantage. It was simple. There are only five Pythagorean solids. There are only a limited number of ways you can put them together, fitting one inside the other. So because it was simple, it's easy to disprove. And what Kepler found, he could disprove it. He could disprove his model. Now, if he had been working with there's earlier models of, that uh, have been popular of one concentric, just a sphere inside a sphere inside a sphere inside a sphere, you could fit that to any um distance of orbits for, of orbits of the planets from the sun but his model forced him to say no it doesn't work and that forced him to search for another um another uh, solution and uh, um what he did was he had to dispense with his metaphysics the metaphysics that it inspired copernicus before him that the heavens were heaven it was part of heaven they didn't think of the heavens as being a place for planets and stars and stuff that was heaven out there where the angels lived and God was behind it all. So it had to be perfect. And perfect meant it had to be perfectly spherical spheres that the planets were rotating on. And um, and that meant that Kepler had to destroy that because he had to bend the circles into ellipses so that you no longer work on spheres. So he cracked these spheres that had survived since ancient times as the way that the... the Cosmos was understood as nested spheres with planets and moons, etc., rotating on, on crystal spheres. Kepler broke those spheres by forcing the planets to um, travel in elliptical orbits. And that was forced on him by the fact that he had kept his model simple because it was based on a fairly simple idea, these uh, Pythagorean solids. If he started, if he had started with a more complex idea, he would have fitted the data from Taika Brahe. And uh, if you can have an arbitrarily complex model, you can fit any data. And what uh, Kepler was forced to do was fit his data to a simple model, and that gave him the proper uh, heliocentric model of the um, of the solar system that we understand today. It's always it's one of the bits that have always stuck with me from Carl Sagan's Cosmos, where you have an actor playing Kepler, and he's desperately trying to get his original theory to work, and you see him cursing every time it falls apart. Um, <laughs> There's, he there's, writes, uh, he writes about it himself really well, actually, of how he tore his uh, hair out and it almost made him mad. And he'd have these mad, he'd have these violent rows with Tycho Brahe about it. And uh, it was really something. He, he, his his book um, uh, that describes this is a great book to read. Actually, it's a kind of biographical account of Kepler's. Um, of Kepler's discovery, but also describes himself and the tortures he went through. And most of it was about abandoning the metaphysical underpinnings of his original inspiration, the Pythagorean solids and this vision of the heavens. And he had to abandon all that to make what he sometimes called a cart full of dung in the heavens. That he thought bringing in ellipses, this ugly, not quite circular curve, was a cart full of dung. And but he was forced to do it, and he was he he used Occam's razor and said, okay, this is the simplest solution that worked, that works. Another scientist might have added some complications to circles within circles that the earlier astronomers used to do, but Kepler was sufficiently 
impressed by the notion of simplicity and he was impressed by it for those kind of elegance reasons that you mentioned before that scientists talk about it often and the mathematicians look for this elegant solutions elegant equations and that elegance is usually simplicity in disguise so can you trust it yes you can if it fits the data but you have to abandon it if it doesn't and that's what kepler managed to do he abandoned his his very simple model to make a more complex one because entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity but if there is a necessity you can add additional entities such as ellipses it's interesting when you took thinking of, of of some scientists who there, there might come a point where it requires the loss of something which has so much become your identity that you can refuse to believe the i mean i mean i was talking with a, a cosmologist about fred hoyle who of course was was brilliant but would not give up on the steady state theory and and, and this particular yeah. cosmologist said he believed that ultimately fred hoyle could not accept the idea that there would be an end to the universe that it, it went so against a core belief beyond his scientific mind and that that's why he stuck with the steady state theory. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that goes back to the original um, uh, comments about William of Ockham and his separation of science from religion. In science, always use reason. And that means throwing away all your metaphysical packet um, uh, baggage of uh, how the universe will beginning or end, because we have no idea, really. And uh, and just reason with the data you have in front of you. And that's uh, really the key part of science. But yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult for all of us. So all of us as scientists come to a po many points in our where a cherished theory that we have about how things work is is disproved by in, in my field often used to be running a gel, a, a gel electrophoresis. And you'd see some bands on the gel and they would not be where you wanted them to be. And that would disprove it. And you but actually, you usually didn't. This proof is is not as easy as people think. Usually, you don't immediately say no. That's it. I'm wrong. No, you say my experiment obviously didn't work, or uh, you add additional entities. You say, oh well, maybe I maybe this happened or that happened. So initially, you have the same approach as Fred Hoyle. You disbelieve stuff. You add additional um, tweaks here and there to try to make your theory fit. When Ockham says, no, get rid of those, deal with it and, uh, and and accept that the simplest theory is likely to be the one that's correct. I mean, there's a, a, an example of this, not within in science, but anyone who's seen, we've talked about this a few times on the show, but Behind the Curve, the documentary about flat earthers. And there is a tremendous sadness in the fact that they come up with ingenious ways of proving that the earth is flat and they keep proving that the earth is round. Mm -hmm. And so they keep going, what's wrong with my experiment? And it's, yeah. it's a really and, and you see an incredible level of ingenuity. These are not stupid people, but they've come to believe something which uh, they will not. They cannot accept that the answer will not be that the earth is flat. Absolutely. My own experience has mostly been with creationists and I've uh, met creationists uh, in many places. And um, and I'm always astonished, but I can't disprove them. I can never prove them wrong because I say, well, what about this fossil? And I say, oh, well, that's because of the um, flood, the great flood that uh, um, uh, flooded the entire earth and everything was buried and under sediment. And I said, OK, OK, well, what about the fact that they are in layers where you have different uh, species of ammonites in different layers, for example, and, uh, um, and plants and animals appear later and, um, and, and they say, no, that's caused by uh, hydraulic sedimentation, that different weights of, of fossils will will fall at different uh, rates and that will cause them to be sedimented, I said, oh, for goodness sake. And then I say, well, what about the fact that you think that creation happened only three and a half uh, or so years, three and a half thousand years ago, and Noah's flood, for goodness sake, was around, you, you think that was around about 1500 years, uh, 1500 BC, when the pyramids were around, wouldn't the ancient Egyptians have noticed that their pyramids are underwater at this time? And they say, oh, you don't really believe carbon dating, do you? And they have an explanation for everything. So as you say, they're clever people, but they haven't separated as William of Ockham urged us to do 700 years ago, separate science from religion. At the time, science, theology was the queen of science. If the it had remained the queen of science, we would still be in the medieval world because we would still have that approach to fusing theology with science and trying to make this 
complicated world in which everything is accounted for by metaphysical entities. William of Ockham was the first person to cut that cord between science and theology. And suddenly, science no longer had to justify itself. And William of Ockham said the physicists, uh, phys physicists should be free to say who, what they like. And again, he was, I think, the first person to kind of make that claim. And all of science derives from that freedom to deliver science without the metaphysics. Now, we've got a few questions coming in. And I must say, by the way, from watching this, the, the book is packed as well as with, with very interesting scientific ideas. Some of the uh, the anecdotes in there. I love the, the, the Roman philosopher who, when he's looking for a teleological reason for the life of pigs, is because pigs need to be alive to keep the meat fresh, uh, which I think is... Uh, and there's some very interesting, rude, angry poetry from Luther as well, uh, <laughs> Luther, which is, uh, which is, yes. is great fun. Uh, the first question we've got is uh, from Polly, who says, uh, do you feel that uh, one of the uh, benefits of COVID, if it can be called, uh, if anything beneficial comes from it, uh, is the fact that people might have now got a greater understanding of molecular genetics and also uh, its use in advances in vaccination. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm astonished that I can be sitting around a dinner table and people will talk about polymerase chain reaction, PCR. This is something that I was doing 20, 30 years ago in my lab. And and people are talking about this technique as if it was uh, uh, just part of the um, part of the dinner table conversation. So I think it has given an appreciation of uh, science and uh, the benefits of science, but not to everyone, of course. We have lots of anti-vaxxers who disbelieve um, the evidence to hand and, um, and it will invent all sorts of crazy ideas about how COVID emerged um, and lots of I, uh, things such as conspiracy theory, uh, conspiracy theories that uh, claim that COVID is, uh, is some kind of uh, plot by uh, super wealthy people like Bill Gates to impregnate us with uh, um, microchips that they can use to control us. And they have complicated theories that will account for all of the data, like the, um, um, the vaccination success and stuff like this, and still believe that vaccines don't work. So I come back to keep coming back to the point that everything we do in science can be undone so long as you don't accept simplicity as a criterion because you can always undo what we believe in in science by claiming no it doesn't happen because this this and this and this and um, um and you have to accept the simplest solution as what William Vocum um insisted and you will get the science and yes it's it's terrific that uh, we are finding uh, lots of people are finding out more about science and i think it really is incumbent upon us as scientists to communicate um what science is all about and and the advantages and um, and benefits of science to humanity which we perhaps don't do as well as we should I've got a question from Elaine who would like to know, uh, could you explain how development in quantum biology might shed light on the emergence of consciousness in complex organs? I imagine this could well be either a five hour lecture or a no, not yet answer. <laughs> I think it's more more of the latter. Um, we don't yet know. Um, I don't think there's any solid evidence that quantum mechanics is involved in consciousness. Um, there's several theorists who have proposed it, but without really any any experimental foundation. It is something that is possible, but in, uh, again, <laughs> and choose a simpler solution. Um, and we are investigating in our quantum biology uh, center whether um, uh, quantum mechanics may be involved in how neurons work. But our default is simplest, that no quantum mechanics isn't involved. And that's our default. And we have to try to prove ourselves wrong. And we are interested enough in the question to try to prove ourselves wrong and to do experiments that one of my students is doing in the lab, maybe as we speak. But um, um, the current default is choose a simpler solution that same rules apply um, it to neurons as other cells and consciousness has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. But I'd be very interested to be proved wrong, but haven't so far. I've got a question from uh, Sarazel here who uh, says, if there is a grand theory of everything with physics, whatever that is, and natural selection is it for biology, do you think there's one that links the two together that we're yet to discover? <laughs> Funnily enough, that brings me to the last chapter of, of my book, Life is Simple, in which... Um, in which I make a, a, a very speculative claim. You're allowed at the at the end of a book 
to speculate a little. And um, one of the theories I found most fascinating in, in physics is the uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, cosmological natural selection. And uh, this is the idea that um, uh, from Lee Smolin, the American scientist Lee Smolin, this is the idea that universes have uh, evolved. And um, it comes to this idea from trying to understand how it is that the fundamental constants of nature, like the number of particles, as masses of particles, the uh, charge on an electron, this kind of stuff, how they come to be the precise values that are needed for us to be here. And um, it's called the fine tuning problem. Um, it seems the universe has got to be very fine tuned. And he looks at biology as an exemplar to answer this problem. We have got to be very fine tuned. Our bodies are very fine tuned to perform what uh, the kind of tasks that we need. And we're extraordinarily improbable from a thermodynamic, if you like, point of view. If you put uh, if you put um, chicken soup into a into a pot, heat it up, you won't get a chicken coming out of it. So living structures are highly improbable uh, from a, a mere thermodynamic point of view, but they've got here through an evolutionary process. So Lee Smolin proposes the same kind of reasoning to argue that the universe's parameters have got to be the, the improbable values that they are today through an evolutionary process. So ours isn't the first universe that before our universe, there were other universes and um, and universes are created in black holes. So black holes are where stars and planets are, uh, and particles are sucked into a uh, what becomes, um, will eventually become a dimensionless point. And if you play that backwards, you have what looks like a big bang. So uh, Simolin and other cosmologists uh, speculate that the other side of a black hole is actually a big bang in another universe. And that universes are constantly making um, other universes, baby universes, if you like, through black holes. And this has been going on for maybe eternity, for certainly much longer than the lifetime of our universe. And that some kind of natural selection process or some kind of process analogous to natural selection has evolved universes to be most fecund, to produce most baby universes, just as natural selection involves living creatures to replicate, to produce the most descendants. And that has resulted in the fine tuning of the fundamental constants, these very narrow values, which um, coincidentally also are the narrow values required for life and us being present in the universe. So if that's the case, then in natural selection, there is a kind of simplicity. There is an Occam's razor in natural selection. We, uh, for example, um, compared to our ancestors, uh, we have very, uh, very much uh, less discriminatory sense of smell. And that's because we've lost hundreds of what are called olfactory receptors genes to, that make olfactory receptors. These are the genes, in, the um, structures in our nose that detect particular odors. We've lost those because they've accumulated mutations because they're no longer useful to us. So if a structure, biological structure, is no longer visible to natural selection because it doesn't make a difference anymore, then it will accumulate mutations until it is lost. So we've lost lots of olfactory receptors because when we be started to walk upright, our nose is much further from the ground, so smell became less important than sight. That meant we lost our sense of smell compared to a dog, say. And um, similarly, in cosmological natural selection, what I suggest, and this is my suggestion, not Lee Smolens, he doesn't believe it, is that a similar process may, may have taken place in, in the evolution of uh, universes in which the criterion of simplicity removed superfluous particles, superfluous forces, superfluous um, parameters that were not needed to make black holes. And Lee Smolin argues that the conditions needed to make black holes are actually very similar to the conditions needed to make life. So the same would apply to the universes in which we find we're here to talk about it all, that a similar process of natural selection may have been may have um, been around to help to explain that um, 
uh, that um, observation of Neil Torex that we started on, that the universe is actually very simple. It doesn't really have much leftover stuff that doesn't have a purpose in, or doesn't have a, a, um, a purpose, but doesn't have a, a, an input into the way we are. So the universe seems to be no more complicated than it needs to be to make us. So maybe something similar to uh, natural selection may account for the simplicity of our universe and thereby why, why Occam's razor works so well. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, so next week, we will be talking probably quite a lot about the olfactory senses uh, with Merlin Sheldrake, who's uh, okay. written a book called Entangled Life, um, which is uh, his adventures with truffles and uh, and fungi and uh, and very much also be joined by uh, Juliet Brody as well. So next week, we will predominantly uh, be talking about plants and uh, and fungi. We've got one final question. Uh, so as I said, we're going to be back next week uh, and uh, do go to our Cosmic Shambles site to find out what some of the stuff that Helen's about. Um, this is is from angry m angry m would like to know is there evidence of science stroke genetics cleaning out bad code like you might do in programming in my work there's lots of unnecessary code left in programs i work with that no longer does anything it's just left over from old versions but it's too much effort to go back and remove it just for the sake of tidiness tidiness yeah that's certainly there's certainly a lot of dead code or what seems to be dead code in our genomes lots of junk dna that um, um is um uh, doesn't seem to have any purpose for us anymore but it's probably harder to get rid of it than um it is to um uh, just leave it there um, we have superfluous structures as as males both uh, you and i uh, Robin, we have nipples. What are they doing there? We don't suckle the young, but it's probably harder from a developmental perspective to get rid of them than it is to retain them. But I think where there is a drive towards simplicity, um, we can see very clearly and tragically in viruses. And viruses are the simplest self-replicating organisms. And uh, they are extremely powerful because they have got rid of all the superfluous stuff in their genome. So they are lean and mean, unlike us who have lots of uh, junk in our genome. Um, the viruses like COVID-19 um, uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2, doesn't have any, any junk DNA, uh, DNA or RNA, in fact, in their genome, but um, uh, is, um, uh, has evolved to become a simple as it can be proving that simplicity can be extremely powerful. It's always, I, I work mostly on trying to understand pathogens and I'm always impressed. This tiny organism, smaller than, far, far smaller than a, 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 a dot on a, a full stop on a, on a page, trillions of, a, a billion times smaller than that, and it can still kill us. So how can these tiny things normally, you know, if you see two dogs fighting, the big one will win, but a virus and us, and the virus wins often. And that's because they are been honed by natural selection to be the simple killers that uh, can still overcome our defenses and um, because they have just enough uh, genetic information to overcome us. So much for joining us. Life is simple. Is it out now? I can't remember if it's, it's just about to be out or whether it, it's... Uh... There it is. Brilliant. It's a life as simple as out now. It is uh, a, a history that takes you through many centuries in terms of understanding the changing uh, language and philosophies of uh, of science and curiosity. I highly recommend you buy it. Uh, the uh, as I said, Anil Seth is currently on Book Shambles. His book, All About Consciousness, is absolutely fantastic. And we've also got Eddie Glaude uh, coming up as the next Tips for Existence. We've got a new series of Uncanny Hour starting pretty soon. Uh, we're going to be talking about the films of Nicholas Rogue, uh, in particular uh, Walkabout and. And uh, also Don't Look Now, but we'll also be talking about Man Who Fell to Earth and uh, his work with Donald Camel uh, performance. So that's coming up very soon. Hopefully we'll have that uh, done by the end of the month. We've got this new series as well, which will be coming out throughout this month, uh, a book you might not know. We'll be back next week with uh, another science Q&A at uh, 10 in the morning. Some of you might be down in next today uh you might not be uh the show that i'm doing with brian cox some of you might be there i don't know but I, i'm back on tour with him just doing some warm-up dates john joe thank you so much for joining us uh and as I said, 
there's so many interesting uh, I wish I could say uh, the name of uh, Luther's uh, poem uh, said in res angry response but I'm not going to because I know we have a broad range of uh, ages of people watching this so thank you very much everyone for supporting us for our Patreon who does that as well thank you very much to our producer Trent Burton and thank you very much John Joe uh, have a great week thank you Robin bye bye